Any questions for any and or all of our panelists? I have a question for Dr. Weber. How can you tell the difference between and within the modes of decision making, kind of a gut feeling versus fear of risk, particularly as you're considering career transition? Thank you. So I don't think there need, needs to be a difference. I mean, fear of I mean, fear is an emotion. It's a gut level reaction. Yeah. And then I guess the question that you're asking is sort of, should you give into that fear, or should you sort of try to overcome it? And I think sort of, you know, and, and of course, part of that is an individual difference. You know, sort of people talk about, you know, there are not that many individual differences economists allow, but risk aversion is one of them. You know, it's actually the, 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 the single one. Uh, and yeah, we all know people sort of who are more risk seeking and who are more risk averse, and that's all right. And you have to live with yourself and you have to live with your own reactions to different types of situations. Uh, and so I think to some extent it's quite reasonable uh, to, to listen to your fears. Now, I think where that sort of uh, recommendation uh, breaks down is when your fear can be irrational. Yeah? And so oftentimes we are afraid of things yeah, because, we, yeah, because they're uncertain. It's not that we have experienced you know, that sort of different universe uh, being in there uh, and sort of think that you know, it's too variable or you know, the downside is too large, but it's just the uncertainty but not quite knowing what we're going to encounter that makes us afraid of that. Uh, and I think there, I think it helps to sort of get as much uh, advice from people who actually who have been in that situation, especially people who are similar to you, who can tell you what the reality is really like, or to even expose yourself. You know? so, so take a week's vacation uh, and, 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 and be an intern or volunteer for that sort of job or for that sort of you know, different lifestyle to see what it feels like. A uh, question, I guess, for all four of you maybe. Is it necessary to have a plan B, or is it better just to have a plan A and realize that plan A can't fail, but while you're doing plan A, you're always, you know, plan Bs can pop up in a plan A, whereas like your total focus is achieving your goal, because if you're not focused completely on that and you have this like sort of backstop, you know, it's like if you're going after plan A and you say, well, I got 100,000 in the bank and, you know, well, I can go to plan B if I get to this, but, you know, it's like, you're not completely focused. Is it better just to be plan A, go for it, and if plan A fails, then you assess and see the contacts you made, everything else after that? So I would say start off with the plan A with three subsets to the plan, so it all stays within the plan, and the backup should be a financial backup. If you actually try to go after two professional opportunities simultaneously, you'll essentially end up halfway on both. So one plan with you know, some variability on how you would handle it, and then money in the bank so that if it doesn't work out, you can move to a new plan A. So I don't think you necessarily need to have a plan B, but I think so to play with plans B, C, and D, especially when you're bored, like sitting on the subway on a really boring concert, yeah, it does, doesn't hurt. Uh, and I think sort of just to know that sort of when things change, it's not going to be the end of the world. I think that's the important sort of realization. Yeah, I used to think, well, there's always a post office. Of course, now the post office will no longer be around much longer. <laughs> but yeah, I think to, to, to realize yeah, that sort of yeah, you have other opportunities yeah, and, and also fully realize that sort of even if you have a plan B, most likely it won't be plan B that you're pursuing, but plan C, D, and E. Uh, I think, I think to, but not to be too fixed on the way things are, I think is not a, not a bad idea. Which is, so. The issue is there's this thing called the internet. So if you have a plan A, there's about 12,000 different options coming at you all the time. So the more additional options you introduce into your mind, the more confusing it all gets. So I still go back, because we're in the 21st century and you're getting pummeled with options all the time, the best thing is to stick with one and really stay focused on that with all the distraction. I apologize, I didn't get a program. Um, the gentleman who was a year behind me, class of 1981. Hey, I, I can't believe it. You, you, with all of your credentials, and you spent two years, and you had a Columbia degree. You had a Columbia engineering degree, right? You, you had two degrees? Well, the Columbia engineering degree is like, <laughs> is incredibly, ridiculously hard. And it, so, I, A, uh, I'm, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of shocked. Like, n no one offered you any kind of job unless you were asking for jobs that paid you several million dollars. That's A, but B, and this is, this is more for the whole group, is, is, is as, as, as many of us become freelancers and entrepreneurial and all that, you know, there's lots of talk about LinkedIn, but what 
in theory, and this sort of goes back to looking for a job, in theory, in theory it's easier to very quickly find out all the people who may be looking for you. And is, is, LinkedIn, is LinkedIn the only answer, or, or are there other, other ways to effectively access the 300 million or so uh, folks out there who, who may be looking for you, not just the United States, but elsewhere? I personally found LinkedIn helpful to me really only as sort of an excuse to talk to somebody I knew I wanted to talk to, but didn't have a real great excuse for talking to them otherwise. So you kind of, I found LinkedIn to be a great break the ice kind of tool, but um, I personally didn't really use it much beyond that. I use it to snoop on people. <laughs> if I want to find out uh, a bit, I, and I will say sometimes when I see folks on, you know, I do it to research is what the right word. Um, but uh, when I do research on people, uh, one of the things I notice is a, a, a huge LinkedIn profile sometimes can scream desperation. So I'd just be, you know, like where it's like, I've got 25 people saying how awesome I am. Um, sometimes you're like, okay, do you, do you really need to do that? So I would just be, I, I mean, I, look, I don't, I've, I have not spent a lot of time on LinkedIn, but I, you know, from a prof for professional reasons, I've gotten, I've gotten to use it a lot, uh, usually to research people. And, and there seems to be a correlation between a very large LinkedIn page and um, the ut utility of their skills. Nope, nothing on LinkedIn. I, I only use LinkedIn to compete with my husband. <laughs> was a broad generalization, just so if, if there are people here with very large LinkedIn pages, I <laughs> don't mean to say that. Bill and Eric, you, you both talked about career changes that you guys made when there was some external event, you know, financial crisis, 9-11, et cetera. Uh, I'm wondering if any of the panelists could give some detail about how to make a change when there isn't that kind of external thing that happens. You know, where, where do you get that motivation from if there isn't some really traumatic thing that happens to, to get you to, to make that next step? I can actually give you a little bit of that. Um, so when, when, I, when I founded this company, Breaking Views, in 2000, uh, it was not under duress. It wasn't because there was some shock to the system. In fact, like I said, 2000 was the greatest year ever for newspaper advertising, yet I left the sort of traditional media. Um, because um, there were a couple of things, maybe some things you pointed out. I was probably 32, um, so it's a little bit, e I don't know, there was a little, there was definitely a sort of, it was easier. Um, and I'm now 45, I think it would be harder. Um, and not just because I, my, you know, like you know, I have two kids and you know, all this stuff. It's just, uh, you just may be more flexible at that point. There was, the other things that were, in, in my, to my mind, were it was, I guess, to, in a way, to your, your point about the net, Eric, which was, like, it'll, I'll find, if, if I jump, it'll, I assume, that, I don't assume, but there's going to be, there's only one way to know it's there, and that's by, you know, making, you know, taking some risk. But, um, I mean, I definitely, I mean, I'd be really interested to hear your view on this, actually, uh, because, um, maybe not to take the conversation away, but, you know, that risk averse thing. I mean, is there a, like a, is there one of these like curves where age goes up, risk aversion kind of goes up and. So, so that, that's a really long story. <laughs> uh, but yes, I think people be, do become, or they, they look like they're becoming more risk averse as, as they get older. Uh, but I think when you look at it more carefully, it tends to be the perception of the risk that goes up. And if you control for that, you know, sort of the willingness to take a risk as you perceive it actually stays pretty constant across the lifespan. Uh, and so I think you know, that, that gets to the discussion we had earlier about how, how accurate are your perceptions of, of, of certain kinds of risks. Uh, and there are individual differences. You know, some people, and if you think about what, what is risk, risk means that's variability. You can't quite exactly predict what you're going to get. It might be a lot better than what you, what you currently have, or it might be a lot worse than what you currently have. And most of the time, people don't give us probabilities in these real life situations, right? You have to sort of generate those you know, based on gut level feeling usually. Uh, and so some people look more at the upside, you know, the eternal optimist. Some people look more at the eternal downside. And you know, I think to the, to the question that sort of we, we started out with, uh, what triggers you know, uh, considerations of change when things are going well? I think typically 
uh, what triggers this is some sort of feeling that, that there's something missing, you know, that either you're not using sort of the full range of your potential, you're getting bored, you've been doing something for a while, you're getting externally rewarded for it, but it just sort of, you know, it, 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 it leaves you feeling sort of you know, incomplete. Or you, you meet someone who sort of, you know, seems to be doing extremely well and say, well, I could be that person, I could be having that sort of fun, why am I not doing that, you know? And it doesn't have, doesn't have to be something that's wrong with your position, but you realize it could be better. So either something, an internal signal, you know, or some sort of external reminder, you know, that, that, that things could be different. And, you know, and, and I think getting back to the, to the risk, I think, you know, sort of some of us, you know, have been more conditioned to sort of to be a little afraid of change. A lot of it has probably has to do with uh, child rearing, you know, whether we were punished for sticking at our necks or whether we were actually rewarded for doing that. That's kind of hard to change. Uh, but I think sort of to the extent that fears are irrational, I think sort of collecting information and actually you know, sort of exposing yourself in an experiential fashion to what that would be like and sort of doing little trial periods, you know, sort of you know, taking, taking a month off and, and, and just seeing what it would be like to start this, this new company doing some research on that. I think that's not a bad idea to get over that hump about sort of the fear of the unknown. I guess I want to say, because of all those experiences, the notion that the net only appears when you jump is something that I just remind myself all the time so that rather than going into the loop of, oh, what's going to happen and it's dangerous, it's like, no matter what happens, I'm here, I'm alive, and I'm breathing. So obviously the net has appeared at every moment. So if you make that a daily mantra, then essentially you're going to shut down all that waiting for a disaster. This is a question for everyone. Uh, let, let's say that you are in a, at the point where you have to decide do I go up the ladder or do I switch fields? Uh, what would you choose? Going up the ladder definitely shows professional growth. Uh, I guess it also says that you can take on responsibility and uh, you, be, you go into a leadership position. But switching might seem also interesting because there are so many other options out there that are very tempting. And you think you have the skills, but still, what do you do? You stumped them. I mean, I would say do what interests you the most. I mean, I know that I personally, you know, I'm just kind of a blockhead, hardhead. And, you know, I spent two years trying to get a job I never got because I said if I work hard enough to keep working, I'm going to get it. But, um, and it wasn't necessarily anything I really probably wanted to do. Yeah, I, I'd second that. I mean, it, the, I guess part of what I was trying to convey is that it's sort of what skill, what is it you have that's special about you that you that that you know makes you I don't know that makes you different because wherever you go, you can apply that those energies or that you know those skills to whatever comes up. And uh, so I mean, I, I when I hear someone say climbing up the ladder, I said what what the ladder is. One thing I think we can you've all learned is the ladder can crumble at any time. So if you've basically decided it's the ladder that you want to climb you know good luck man because that ladder you know is it's the ladders are shaky so the ladder that i thought you know one could go you know hey i'm gonna go and do this newspaper that and then you go up and then someday i'll have this great office in the new york times in the corner looks out on the hudson and you know well now that building's but you probably sublet it when you were at cibc <laughs> or something you know it's like it was sale and lease back or something so they could pay you the bills. Um, so just be careful with the ladder. Think about what it is that you have because when the ladder goes out, you need, still need to have some skill to grab, grab the, the rock or whatever the hell it is. Uh, so I, I guess I would say the, the up the ladder is a completely different skill set than when you're lower on the ladder. So you know, higher up the ladder, it's all a game of politics and not to do with the work. So when you're making that decision about where you want to go, you have to really kind of understand what does it mean to move up the ladder? Because the top person on the ladder is not doing any work. They're just playing politics. So if you want to do that, that's great. But if that's not one you do, you'll be roadkill pretty fast. <laughs> well said. <laughs>